Recently, Dallas megachurch pastor Robert Morris said in one of his sermons, I know there is a God. So this is the second episode of a three-part series wherein I show him that he doesn't know that nor anything else he professed to know in that sermon. So you have to understand there is a correct worldview, okay? In the previous episode, we talked about how the scientific and humanist perspective is the correct worldview and definitely not that of Christianity nor of any other religion either. So that's point one. So here's point two. Now, before I give it to you, let me say this. Um, atheism, by definition, I'll explain it to you in a moment, says, makes the statement, there is no God. Those four words, there is no God. Okay. No, that's incorrect. So just hang on, just stay with me, okay? Here's my point too, okay? There is no atheist. It is scientifically impossible to be an atheist. And I can prove it to you. And even if you might have a different opinion, you probably will still have no answer for this. I promise you. Because I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use science, okay? No, you're gonna break your promise and you're not gonna use science. You don't know how to use science and you wouldn't if you could. The word science means knowledge. That's what it means. The definition of science, I actually wrote it down from Webster's Dictionary, is knowledge about or study of the natural world based on facts learned through experiments and observation. So in other words, the only way, if it's science, you have done a study and you have based your knowledge on facts and experiments, okay? When we're talking about the natural world, yes, but you're talking about the supernatural. Now, science cannot even address that because there's no evidence of it, though you believe it anyway, just because you want to, and there's no way to test it because there's no way to falsify it that the mystics would accept because you have to believe it regardless or be damned if you don't, or so you say, though there's no reason to believe you when you say that. So uh, let's talk about this no God. Uh, that is what the word atheist means. No, it isn't. If you Google atheism, you'll see that it is a disbelief or lack of belief in the existence of God or gods. This is the common usage. And notice that Google also defines disbelief as an inability or refusal to accept that something is true or real and not necessarily belief that it is false. You can look this up almost anywhere and you'll find the same definition even though most dictionaries were written by Christians. Of course, atheists understand their own position better than you do. American Atheist, for example, says that atheism is one thing a lack of belief in gods, and not necessarily a belief that no gods exist. Although those who believe there is no god are a subset of those who lack belief in god. Neither one has a belief in any god. And likewise, Atheist Alliance International also defines atheism as being without belief in a god or gods, or the lack of belief in a god or gods. So that's what atheism really means. Now let me just say, they're, they're, they've changed the definition now. They've changed it because they realize that it's impossible to be an atheist. No, if you look up atheism in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, that's about the only site that defines atheism the way you do. But it's wrong because it's based on the faulty assumption that if atheism is defined in terms of theism and theism is the proposition that God exists and not the psychological condition of believing that there's a God, then it follows that atheism is not the absence of the psychological condition of believing that God exists. However, as I've already shown, the consistent, common, standard definition cited by every one of the self-identifying atheist organizations is that theism is the psychological condition of believing that a God exists. And theistic believers agree with that too. Even your own statement of faith supports this. Thus, atheism is the absence of the psychological condition of believing that any gods exist. It's not necessarily a rejection of the proposition, but rather a rejection of belief in the proposition. And the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy admits this, saying that it is important to recognize that the term atheism is polysemous, i.e. it has more than one related meaning even within philosophy. Thus, weak atheism as a lack of belief is certainly a legitimate definition in the sense that it reports how a significant number of people use the term. A significant number of people being a consensus of how virtually all atheists self-identify. Again, look at the original word. Atheism or athe, theos, theo comes from the Greek word God. A is an antonym, which is, means opposite or not or no. It literally, the word literally means no God. No God. That's what it means. No, the A means without. So atheist means without gods or godless. 
Theism is a God belief. So without theism means without God belief. Thus, atheists are without a God belief. Theists have a God belief, atheists do not. It all comes down to this one question. Do you believe in a God? Yes equals theist, no equals atheist. It really is that simple. Look at your own mythology. When you die, you're supposed to go before St. Peter at the pearly gates, and he asks one question. Did you believe in God? Because remember, it doesn't matter how evil you were. All sins may be forgiven if you but believe, but if you don't believe, then it doesn't matter how good you were, because the only sin that will not be forgiven is the sin of disbelief. And we're told to believe this on faith according to an assumption of authority rather than indicative evidence and maybe even in spite of evidence to the contrary. So gullibility is the sole criteria for redemption. St. Peter does not ask whether you know there is a God. No one even can know that, so you don't know it either. Instead, the pearly gatekeeper is supposed to ask whether you believed there was a God. Yes means possible forgiveness and a stairway to heaven. No means a fate worse than death down the highway to hell. If you're an innocent, agnostic, non-theist, doesn't matter, you're all going to hell in the same handbasket. So, whether we're standing at the pearly gates or before a theocratic magistrate, the question before us was never, is there a God? The question imposed upon us throughout history and theology is and always was, do you believe in a God? Whoever or whatever collective cannot answer yes to that question is atheist. They do not have the psychological condition of believing that a God exists. So you can't go changing the definition now, or you could create a new word. Creating new words is part of the reason you're confused. In 1869, Darwin's bulldog, Thomas Huxley, invented the word agnostic, apparently because he was annoyed at some atheist in his day, claiming that having just discovered all this evidence of evolution disproved the Bible and consequently disproved God. He thought that was too simple to be a fair assessment because not everyone is a biblical literalist. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So rather than counter them the way he should have, he tried to distance himself from him by wearing a different label. So he made up a word that meant exactly the same thing that atheism already did, not believing in a God. But he added that agnosticism also meant not believing there's not a God. This caused some people to think that atheism must have meant having a positive belief that there is no God. However, Webster's 1828 dictionary already defined atheism as the disbelief of the existence of God. And it defined disbelief as refusal of credit or faith, denial of belief, not denial of the claim, but denial of belief in the claim. So the common definition of atheism 40 years before Huxley's attempted redefinition was already the same one that we're still using a century and a half after that too. If you want to come up with a new word to say, I don't believe there is a God, then come up with a new word. But I'm using the original and still consistent common meaning that never changed. The contrast is and always was between those who believe and those who don't believe. Now, Within atheism, there are those who think that a god may be possible, but that there isn't enough evidence to convince them of that, so they lack belief. I was like that myself for decades. But now, I am one of the anti-theists, who realize that God is not even possible, and that there is overwhelming evidence that your god is an entirely fictional character, like Superman or Pecos Bill, since I'm talking to a fellow Texan. But regardless whether they lack a belief in God, or whether they have a belief that there is no god, they still answer St. Peter's question the exact same way. No, we don't believe in a God. But if you want to use the word atheist, scientifically there's no atheist because you can't definitively say there is no God and I'll prove it to you. Yes, we can. At least if we're talking about the Bible God, especially from the perspective of a biblical literalist. Now, I know that your statement of faith says that the Bible is the absolutely infallible authority and that nothing can ever be added to it in any regard. That's what it says in Deuteronomy twice before a bunch of other books were added to the Hebrew Bible. It says it again in Revelations, which is one of several more books that were added later on by other authors of a different religion. Your statement of faith also says that no one can subtract from the Bible either, except for all these books that your Bible refers to, but that were removed by the fallible human authors and editors sorting and assembling this haphazard compilation of fables and folklore. I mean. Why would God's Word refer to these other books that were written by mere fallible people? Unless they were all written by people, which of course they were. Just like the Vedic scriptures, the Adi Granth of the Sikhs, the Avestas of Zarathustra, the Kitab i Akdas of Baha'u'llah, and a host of other man-made myths claiming to be the absolute truth and the revealed Word of the one true God. 
Since you are a biblical literalist, that means this is your God. Because you think that if the Bible is wrong, then God is wrong because you can't distinguish doctrine from deity. So you think that disproving any of the tall tales in your favorite book of bedtime stories disproves your God right along with it. And of course, there are so many of these fables that we know for absolutely certain did not really happen and are not true. For example, back in 2001, senior rabbi David Wolpe said that the truth is that virtually every modern archaeologist who has investigated the story of the Exodus, with very few exceptions, agrees that the way the Bible describes the Exodus is not the way it happened, if it happened at all. He said that to his own Jewish congregation in a sermon on Passover. So you know it was an important admission. And it's not just a consensus among archaeologists. In the years since then, a growing number of historians have given up on the idea of a historical Moses. That character was evidently based on at least a handful of other people. Now, Dr. Francis Collins is an evangelical Christian, but he's also an award-winning scientist, and he was the director of the Human Genome Project. He says that, unfortunately, the concepts of Adam and Eve as the literal first couple and the ancestors of all humans simply do not fit the evidence. Though we already knew that the myth of Adam and Eve was adopted and adapted from previously pagan mythology and rewritten as a parable that was meant to be interpreted metaphorically. It's not real. It's only symbolic. Talking snakes and magic trees should have given you your first clue. Well, after the tale of Adam being created by a golem spell, and after comparing the conflicting descriptions of creation between the first and second chapters of Genesis, and that's before we get to all of the other absurdities, atrocities, inconsistencies, contradictions, and failed prophecies strewn throughout this whole collection of man-made mythology. And we know that none of the most cited stories in this book ever really happened. The Tower of Babel obviously didn't happen, and God never wrestled with Jacob, and there was never a guy who lived three days inside a fish or a whale. The people who wrote the Bible didn't know there was a difference. And I made a video series showing how meteorology, geology, paleontology, dendrochronology, zoology, anthropology, archaeology, and even mythology all disproved Noah's flood absolutely and conclusively. I'll include a link to that playlist below. Um, in order for you to say that something exists, you have to have done a study, you have to have the facts to back it up. That's true. Positive claims require positive evidence. Absolutely, yes. You have to be able to show that there's at least some objectively verifiable data just to know whether there is any potential truth to what you're saying. The burden of proof is always on the one making the positive claim. Otherwise, it's just baseless speculation, not even worthy of discussion. Yet, here you are pretending to know that there is a God when you don't have any facts and evidence to back that up. Before we can say whether something is even possible, there must be some precedent or parallel or verified phenomenon indicating whether such a possibility actually exists. We don't have that for your God, which means there is literally not even a possibility that your God exists. But in order to say something doesn't exist, you'd have to have all knowledge. You'd have to know everything to say that, that this doesn't exist. You have to know everything. Wrong again, as always. Science is only concerned with what is supported by evidence. Whatever is not supported doesn't warrant serious consideration. You have to have the evidence to back the claim before you make it, just like you said a moment ago. Because if you don't have that evidence, then your claim is invalid. Understand that an unsupported assertion has no more credence than a claim that has already been proven false. And if you're inclined to make unsupported assertions, you will immediately lose all credibility. In any other practice, that would be called lying. Only in religion are out-and-out -out lies rebranded as a revelation of absolute truth. It's like when you make up your own statistics, saying that 50% of the people are like this, or 99.9% .9 of the time it's like that. If you don't have any source to show where you got the data to back that up, and yet you're stating it as a fact, here in Texas, as you know, we call that talking out of your ass. <laughs> That's what all your claims about absolute truth amount to, just lies. So I don't have to say that your God doesn't exist except in reply to your empty assertion that he does until you can show the facts to back that up. Let me give you an example. If you said to me, there is no city called Paris, Texas, I would say to you, show me your study. Show me how you came to that knowledge 
what facts you may set on, what experiments you'd had. But otherwise, it's not, a sci it's not scientific. It's just your opinion. Remember that you just said that because those words are going to come back to bite you. If you say there is no Paris, Texas, then I'd say, have you been to every city in Texas? And if you haven't been to every city in Texas or studied every city, then you can't definitively say there is no city named Paris, Texas. No one would say that they'd studied every city, nor would they know if they had, even if they thought they did. They could have missed one and not noticed. And likewise, you can't say there's no Darth Vader. It doesn't matter that you know who wrote the screenplay for Star Wars and what it was based on, that all those books and movies are all sensationalized fiction just like your Bible is. You still can't prove there's no Darth Vader because by your logic, you'd have to, you'd have, to have searched every planet around every star and all the space between the stars in every galaxy far, far away, and you would have to have already done that a long time ago. So you can't absolutely prove that there is no Darth Vader. But Neither can you say that there is one and expect anyone to take you seriously until you have the evidence to back that claim. I can say there is, by the way, because I've been there. And by the way, it's nothing like Paris, France. <laughs> but it's a nice city. If you're watching from Paris, Texas, hey, it's a nice city. I grew up in East Texas, so I know there's a Paris, Texas because we beat them in football. Just wanted you to know we, we beat them in football. So, but there is a Paris, Texas. Well, you can't say there's not a Paris, Texas unless you've done a study and you have facts and you've been to every or you've studied every city in Texas. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Just five minutes before you said this, you also said... There is no. Now, look it up for yourself. Don't just listen to someone else. There is no evidence. None. Listen. Listen to what I'm going to say before you discount the sentence. Listen to the end of the sentence. There is no evidence that one species has ever mutated to another species. Never. How could you know that there's no evidence? Do you know everything? Obviously not. You have no facts. You're just asserting alternative facts to support your alternative reality. Have you done any study of this at all? Obviously not. And you've done no experiments either because just 10 seconds on Google Scholar would have provided literally tons of evidence had you only bothered to look. So it's not scientific, it's only your opinion. Stated as if it were a fact, which makes it a lie. You also said, No species has ever evolved from one species to another, never. Have you watched every individual in every generation of every species, everywhere around the world and in the oceans too, over all the eons that life has existed on this planet? Or are you still talking out of your ass and ignoring all the volumes of evidence available just a few keystrokes away? So in the very same way, you can't say there is no God if you don't have all knowledge. We don't have to disprove a negative that was never indicated in the first place. Just as it is true that positive claims require positive evidence, Hitchens Razor says that what is asserted without evidence may be dismissed without evidence because we have no reason to believe you. You have to at least show that there's a there there, or we have nothing to talk about. Now, let me explain that, okay? How much of all knowledge does the smartest person in the world have? All knowledge. All knowledge. All history of every culture that exists now and has ever existed. How much do you know? Just if you're the smartest person. How much do you know of all history of every culture. How much of all mathematics do you know? All algebra, all geometry, all calculus, all mathematics, how much do you know? Um, how much science do you know? How much English do you know? Not just English, but how much language would be a better way to say it. Language, you know. By the way, there are over 7,000 languages in the world right now. How many can you speak fluently? And there are over 31,000 languages that have ever existed. 31,000. So how many of those languages do you know? I'm trying to figure out how much of all knowledge do you know? Can you, do you know every vowel uh, and every consonant of every language that's ever existed? And can you conjugate every verb in every language? Now, I realize I've lost some of you with the word conjugation. I realize that, and I know some of you are thinking, well, 
Pastor, my wife and I waited till after we were married to conjugate. Okay, that's that's a different word. Let's so <laughs> sorry. I just couldn't resist that one. Okay, that's just a joke on the word conjugation, okay? But so how much does the smartest person in the world possess of all knowledge? Now, here's what the smart people say. Less than 1%. Less than 1%. Matter of fact, there is someone today who is called the smartest man in the world. He has the highest IQ in the world right now of anyone living. His name is Christopher Langan. And I just want to just give you one statement that the smartest person in the world makes. Here, this, listen to this statement. This is the smartest person in the world. His IQ is higher than every person in the world. He says, you can prove the existence of God, the soul, and an afterlife using mathematics. Now, that's what the smartest person in the world says. Then why hasn't he ever done it? Why hasn't anyone ever done it using his or any other formulae? I was going to make a video about Christopher Langan a few months ago, but I decided not to because it would be unnecessarily mean. His model failed, and he doesn't deserve any more attention. But since you brought him up, Langan is a horse rancher and a former bar bouncer in Montana who nonetheless scores very high on IQ tests for whatever that's worth. We know that the reliability or value of IQ tests is hotly debated by experts, but let's be generous and count it as objectively demonstrated that Chris Langan's IQ is roughly 195. And consequently, some journalists have called him the smartest man in America. Some academics, however, have a very different impression after reviewing his work. Langan's cognitive theoretic model of the universe claims to constitute absolute truth, providing the logical framework of a theory of everything, and he says that it will prove the existence of God mathematically. However, this model was published nearly two decades ago, and physicists today still don't have a working theory of everything. They can't show any truth to his model at all, much less absolute truth. And theologians around the world agree that belief in God still requires faith in absence of his mathematic proof. So Langan believes that there is a physical reality external to our minds and that other dimensions exist in addition to that. He also says that he can see these other dimensions by recognizing connections and correlated patterns. You know, the same way paranoid conspiracy theorists see patterns no one else can see. Except that Langan says he only sees these during REM sleep, which of course means that he's just dreaming this all up. As I said, I could go on, but I don't want to be mean. But the smart people in the world say that probably the smartest person in the world might possess, that they say it's less than 1%. So let's just say it's 1%. And let's say you're that person. Is it possible in the 99% <laughs> of all knowledge that you do not possess, is it possible that something exists that you don't know about? Of course. You, you couldn't answer that question any other way. We're not talking about even probabilities, we're talking about possibilities, but the probability mathematically would be yes as well, because it's 99% probability. So is it possible in the 99% of all knowledge you don't possess, something exists? Yes, of course it is. So you can't say definitively it doesn't exist unless you have all knowledge. It's one thing to admit that some undefined something exists that we don't know about, that's certain. But you're talking about a very specific thing. What you're doing that all religious fundamentalists do is you're committing the logical fallacy of shifting the burden of proof. The philosopher and Nobel laureate Bertrand Russell proposed a nice illustration of the failure of the argument that you're using. He wrote that if there was a teapot, a normal everyday teapot orbiting the sun somewhere in space between Earth and Mars, it would be too small to be seen by telescopes. So you couldn't prove that it's not there. But that's no reason to believe that it is there. And there's no possibility that it could be there. So it would be absurd to even consider it unless there was evidence indicating it. If there's not, then we are perfectly justified in saying that there is no celestial teapot. And the same goes for leprechauns. Even if they were real, you could search all of Ireland and never find one because we're told that leprechauns are invisible when they want to be. But not only do we know how people like to make up tall tales about supernatural nonsense, we also know that it is biologically impossible for humans to be that tiny or to turn invisible. A Christian preacher even told me that he knows that there's no such thing as leprechauns simply because there's no evidence of them 
And I would add that another reason to know that would be that their magic is impossible by definition. You cannot say there is no God. Yeah, we can. There are a few things that are absolute, and we don't know anything absolutely. We don't have perfect or complete knowledge about anything. But within the bounds of reason, yeah, I know that God does not exist to the same degree and for the same reasons that I know that leprechauns don't exist. Now, um, what you can say is, I don't know if there's a God. That is an agnostic. Now, um, we say agnostic is the way we divide the word. But the G actually goes with Gnostic. It comes from a Greek word. The G is silent. It's Gnosticism. It means knowledge. A, again, is an antonym. And it means not or I don't know. I don't know if there's a God. Yeah. I used to be an agnostic atheist myself for about 15 years before I finally got to the point that I realized that gods, ghosts, and magic are not even possible. And that it's silly to even pretend to give such things a benefit of the doubt. So... I'm an anti-theist or a strong atheist now. You can say, I don't know if there's a God. You're right. I can say that you don't know there's a God, because that's a true statement. If you can't show it, you don't know it, and you shouldn't pretend that you do. But you cannot definitively say there is no God. Yes, I can, definitively, because God, at least your God, is defined by his miraculous nature. The miracles and magic are essentially the same thing, both being the evocation of supernatural forces or entities to control or forecast natural events in ways that are inexplicable by science because they defy the laws of physics. And anything that defies the laws of physics is physically impossible by definition, and thus God is impossible by extension. I can say that there's no God logically, too. If God exists beyond time and space, then there is no time and place where or when God exists. Because if God exists outside reality, then he does not exist in reality. And if you do say it, I would think that you don't, because you don't have all knowledge, it's 99% that you don't have, even if you're the smartest person, I would say it's foolish to make a statement like that. And the Bible says the same thing. Psalm 14, 1, the fool is said in his heart, there is no God. The exact statement of atheism. Understand that a fool is commonly understood to be one who too readily accepts improbable claims from questionable sources on insufficient evidence. So it's no surprise that the Bible and the Quran both use the opposite definition because the purpose of the scriptures is to fool you. That's why they both demand that you believe on faith or else. That's why they both say that a fool is whoever does not believe impossible nonsense for no good reason. Those who were duped by any of the violently conflicting religions based on these scriptures would say that there is a God because they were fooled into believing that. But what about those who weren't so foolish as to believe such improbable claims from such a questionable source and without any evidence at all? When they know that there is no truth to the claim whatsoever, not even a possibility that it could be true, then what would they say? There is no God. Exactly. And again, I'm saying, if you look at the definition today, they're changing it to a person who doesn't believe in God. But the reason they've changed it is because they've realized, scientifically, you can't say there is no God. Yes, we can say that there is no God, if it is in response to your empty assertion that there is one. And we won't even assume the burden of proof if we do that. But we never changed the definition. Atheism was originally used as an insult. The Greek Hellenists used to call the Christians godless without theism, and the Christians used to lob the same pejorative back at the pagans. But the very first atheist, Matthias Knudsen, the first person ever to adopt the label by choice, admitted that he was an atheist simply because he did not believe in any god. And he invented a new label to account for the fact that he also denies God as well as religious scriptures and clergy. So atheists already meant nothing more than a lack of belief in God in the very beginning, just like it still does today. And the first guy to wear the atheist label proudly was Paul Henry Thierry, also known as Baron de Holbrock. He wrote an in-depth description, defense, and praise of atheism in the broader sense of those who lack belief in God. And he distinguished atheists from those who also reject the God proposal. So he wasn't an anti-theist like me. He was only an atheist. And he said that all children are born atheists because they have no idea of God. So no. Atheism always meant unbelief, originally and primarily, rather than the claim that there is no God, which applies to only a, a few within that much larger category. So you've been arguing a false premise in defense of a false promise. Even if you might have a different opinion, you probably will still have no answer for this. 
I promise you.